Michael Kitchen is Louis Mazzini, and Harry Enfield plays the Dascoin family in Kind Hearts and Coronets. Adapted for radio by Gilbert Travers Thomas from the Ealing Comedy screenplay by Robert Hamer and John Dighton. Kind Hearts and Coronets. A Capital Punishment Amendment Act, 1868. The sentence of the law passed upon Louis Dascoy Mazzini, Duke, Duke of Chalfont, found guilty of murder, will be carried into execution at 8 a.m. tomorrow. A Duke, I <laughs> Well, well. Good evening, Mr. Elliot. Good evening, Warder. Nice drop of rain? Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Just sign the book, if you will. Yes. Been keeping you busy, Mr. Elliot. Oh, just nicely, you know. This one we've got for you tomorrow is something special. Oh, yes, very much so. Even after all my years in the profession, I'm quite looking forward to him. <laughs> there you are, Warder. Thank you. Well... I must be getting along. The governor in? Yes, he's expecting you. Oh, well, good night. Good night, Mr. Elliot. Uh, usual cup of tea at seven. Oh, please. <laughs> good evening, governor. Ah. Well, Elliot, this is a very terrible occasion. Yes, it is indeed, sir. Even my lamented master, the great Mr. Harry himself, never had the privilege of hanging a duke. Uh, Quite, quite. What a finale to a lifetime in the public service. Finale? Oh, yes. I intend to retire. Ah. After using the silken rope, never again to be content with hemp. Quite. Do you wish to um, have a look at the Duke? Just a glimpse. An idea of size and weight, you know. Quite. Um, how will he approach it? I should think as the calmest you've ever known. Mm, noblesse obliged, doubtless. <laughs> a difficult client can make things most distressing. Some of them tend to be very hysterical and so inconsiderate. <sighs> well, Colonel, considering the importance of the occasion, I shall retire early. The last execution of a duke in this country was very badly bungled. Oh, that was in the old days of the axe, of course. Quite. Oh, uh, I almost forgot. Um, you must forgive my ignorance, but when we meet in the morning, what is the correct form of address? Uh, your Lordship. Your Grace. Really? Oh, your Grace. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, your Grace. Uh, good morning, your Grace. Uh, good morning, your, your Grace. Good evening, Your Grace. Oh, good evening, Colonel. Will you have a glass of wine? Um, thank you, no. I, um, I called to inquire whether you had any special wishes for breakfast. Well, just coffee and a slice of toast, thank you, and perhaps a few grapes. I hate to disappoint the newspaper reading public, but it'll be too early for the conventional hearty breakfast. The appointment is at eight. Is it not? At eight, uh, yes. Uh, well, if there's nothing further I can do for you... No, nothing, thank you, Colonel. Unless, uh... Your Grace? This quill. It scratches abominably as I write. Of course. I'll have another sent down from my office. Thank you. Uh, we shall have the opportunity of making our adieus in the morning, I presume. I regret to say, yes. Good night, Your Grace. Good night, Colonel.
A Brief History of the Events Leading Thereto, written on the eve of his execution by Louis Dascoigne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, who, who ventures to hope that this confession of his guilt may prove not uninteresting to those who remain to read it. With so little time remaining to complete my story, it is difficult to choose where to begin it. Perhaps I should begin at the beginning. My mother was the daughter of the seventh Duke of Chalfont. As soon as she was of age, she eloped with a handsome Italian singer called Mazzini. thus exchanging the medieval splendours of Chalfont Castle for the modern conveniences of number 73 Balaclava Avenue, London South West, where, <laughs> after a decent interval, I arrived on the scene. Che bello, Cicino, piccolino, bellissimo. Amore mio carino, caruccio. However, my father succumbed to a heart attack at the moment of his first setting eyes on me. Thus, early in his career, Papa was sent to join the heavenly choir, and in the circumstances it will be understood that I have but light memory of him. Reduced to an even deeper poverty by my father's death, Mama swallowed her pride, and made an effort of reconciliation with her family. They did not even reply to her letter. So in order to keep us both alive, she was reduced to the horrible expedient of taking a lodger. And this is the sitting room, Mr Perkins. Ah, uh, hmm. Well, Mrs... I, I, I think we might come to some arrangement. Say, um... Twenty-five shillings a week? Thus... Protected by Mama's small annuity and the weekly contributions of Mr. Perkins, I passed from infancy to childhood in an atmosphere of family history and genealogies until I knew the descent of the House of Chalfont by heart. The dukedom had been bestowed by Charles II on Colonel Henry Dascoigne for services rendered to His Majesty during his exile. Sire. Later for services rendered to His Majesty after his restoration by the Duchess. Oh, sire. <clears throat> the title was granted the unique privilege of descending by the female as well as the male line. It was therefore theoretically possible that via Mama, I might inherit the dukedom. Mama scraped and saved and sent me to the best school she could afford. In view of my present predicament, one little incident there occurs to me as amusing. Lionel Holland, what is the Sixth Commandment? Come, come now, surely you know what the Sixth Commandment is. Someone else then, Sibella. I know, please. Louis Mazzini. All right, tell us. Thou shalt not kill. No, in those days I never had any trouble with the Sixth Commandment. As to the Seventh, I was hardly of an age to concern myself with it, although I was old enough to be in love. Sibella, for that was her name, and her brother were my only friends, and we grew up together. In their case, Mama relaxed her objection to my associating with the local children. At least their father, Dr. Hallwood, was a professional man. But alas, those carefree school days soon passed, and when I was 17, Mama decided to have a serious talk with me. Now, Louis, the time has come to think very carefully about your future. Well, it should be quite easy to get a job. Not a job, dear, a career. Now, who do we know who could help us? Well, we don't really know anyone except the family, and they don't know us. Well, the least we can do is to try once more. I shall write to Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne. He could surely do something in that bank of his. Bank, Mama. This is a private bank, Louis, dear. They don't pass money over the counter. The letter was duly dispatched, and this time we did get an answer. 
Madam, I am instructed by Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne to inform you that he is not aware of your son's existence as a member of the Dascoyne family. Signed by his secretary. It's, it's very stupid of him, of them all, not to admit your existence when one day you might be Duke of Chalfont. Oh, it's a very big might, Mama. There must be at least twelve people before me. Stranger things have happened. I don't wish to be unchristian. But in view of their attitude, I could almost wish those twelve people should all die tomorrow. Oh, all except one, Mama, because you must be Duchess of Chalfont before I'm Duke. No, it'll have to be a job and not a career after all, Mama. I'm afraid so, Louis. But, oh dear, a Dascoin in trade. Even potential Dukes have to eat. Mr Perkins, our lodger now for nearly 15 years, did his best to be helpful. Well, Louis, I've had another chat with Mr Parsons, our manager. He says you can start any time you like. I suggest Monday week. Thus, the possible future Duke of Chalfont became what was known as a General Draper's Assistant, and this humiliation continued for two dispiriting years. Then one day, Mama, who had broken her glasses and couldn't afford to have them mended, was knocked down by a tram near Clapham Junction and fatally injured. Louis? Louis, where are you? I'm here, Mama. Louis? Yes, Mama? I should like to be buried at Chalfont in the family vault. You're not going to die, Mama. Promise me, Louis. Promise. Mama! I wrote to the Duke of Chalfont, informing him of Mama's dying wish. His reply was the curtest possible refusal. Two days later, Mama was buried, and standing by her poor little grave in that hideous suburban cemetery, I made an oath that I would revenge the wrongs her family had done her. It was no more than a piece of youthful bravado, but it was one of those acorns from which great oaks are destined to grow. Even then, I went so far as to examine the family tree and prune it to just the living members, of which there were no less than twelve. But what could I do to hurt them? What could I take from them? Except, perhaps, their lives. I even speculated as to how I might contrive it. But there were other more urgent problems. Mama's tiny income came from an annuity and had died with her. The problem of how to live on 25 shillings a week was solved for me by an invitation from Dr. Hallward to lodge with them. It was galling to accept the status of a poor relation, but the certainty of seeing Sibella every day was too tempting to be refused. Well, Sibella... I'll let you into a secret. It was my idea. It was? Oh. Who's that? I've got to go out. Who with? Lionel Holland. Will you remember him? He's rather dull, but his father's very rich. A suit supper. The next few years brought many such heartaches, but they also brought promotion. I decided that if I was to be a draper, at least I would not be a suburban draper, so I migrated to a larger, modern store which had just been opened in the West End at the gigantic salary of two pounds a week. Every lunchtime I went to the reading room of the public library to see how my inheritance was proceeding. Sometimes a death's column brought good news. Ah, excellent. Sometimes the births column brought bad news. Oh. The advent of twin sons to the Duke was a terrible blow. Fortunately, an epidemic of diphtheria restored the status quo almost immediately and even brought me a bonus in the shape of the Duchess, who succumbed at the same time as her children. But the Duchy of Chalfont was not all-absorbing. There were other matters to concern me of a more personal nature. That summer, the Hallwoods gave a party. Wow! That's the last of them, thank heaven! Oh, what an evening! Well, I thought it was a very nice evening. Mm, it may have been for you, 
Oh, it's awful being a woman, having to dance with a lot of dull men. Laugh at their jokes while they're treading on your feet. I didn't tread on your feet. Mm, you're not dull. And your jokes are funny. Well, thank you. Sibella? Mm? Sibella, will you marry me? <laughs> oh, no, of course not. And do get up on your knees like that. You may be half Italian, but even so, you do look silly playing the stage lover like that. Oh, I look silly, do I? Yes, very. <gasps> mm. Mm. Do I still look silly? No. Now will you marry me? No. Why not? Because I just said I'd marry Lionel. Oh, you can't. Why not? Well, he's a clod. He's not a gentleman. Oh, listen, who's talking? Who ever heard of a gentleman blacking the lodger's boots? That's a wicked thing to say. Just because Mama was poor. Lionel will be very rich one day. Well, I might be a duke one day. Mm, pigs might fly. No, I might. Really, I might. You see, Mama was the daughter of the seventh Duke of Chalfont. Oh. oh, yes, I know. Well, when you are a duke, you just come and show me your crown, or whatever it is called, and then I'll feel awfully silly, won't I? Yes, you will. Anyhow, I'm going to marry Lionel. And now I'm going to bed. Oh, good night, Louis. If there was a precise moment at which my insubstantial dreaming took on solid purpose, that was it. The Dascoins had not only wronged my mother, they were the obstacle between me and all that I wanted. There were then some eight people between me and the dukedom, all seemingly equally out of reach. It's so difficult to make a neat job of killing people with whom one is not on friendly terms. I was almost resigned to its being an impossibility when one afternoon, at a moment when my thoughts were furthest from the subject, fate took a hand. If you've nothing better, these will have to do. No, I'm afraid not, sir. Uh, all right. Will a couple do, Priscilla? Thank you, Charles. These London shops are so far behind Paris in this sort of thing. Parcel them up quickly and we'll take them with us. Charge them to my account. Yes, sir. What's the name? Mr. Ascoin Dascoin. At last I was face to face with one of them. This was the son of Lord Ascoin Dascoin, the banker whose refusal to help me towards a more dignified career had led to my present ignominious occupation. In my excitement and anger, I listened openly to their conversation. I booked rooms at Crookshanks at Maidenhead. I thought we'd go down late on Friday afternoon and stay until Monday. Are you sure it's safe? It's the most discreet place I know. Oh, you've been there before then? No, no of course not. What I mean is... Um... Hey, you! Yes, sir? Get on with that parcel and never mind what we're talking about. Don't you dare talk to me like that. I think I'm interested in your idiotic conversation. Oh! If you want to add impertinence to your eavesdropping, we'll soon see about that. Send for the manager. The upshot was that I was dismissed on the spot. I decided to repay him in kind by dismissing him with equal suddenness from this world. His conversation had told me where I could probably find the opportunity to kill him, and Dr. Hallwood's dispensary could, I thought, provide me with the means. With a week's wages I had received in lieu of notice, I invested in suitable apparel for Maidenhead and booked a modest single room at Crookshanks. That evening, after dinner, I took a stroll through the hotel in search of my quarry, and found them having coffee and liqueurs together on the terrace. I decided to take the bull by the horns. Uh, do forgive me, haven't we met somewhere before? I don't think so. Well, that's funny, because I could have sworn I knew your face. Were you at Monty last year? The year before. Ah, that must be it. Would you and your companion join me for a drink? Thank you, not this evening. We're rather tired. Yes, of course. I deprecated their retiring so early, but it was hard to blame them, for weekends, like life, are short. The next morning, I waited for them to come down. And the next afternoon. But they didn't appear the whole day. Nor the morning after. 
I no longer felt sentimental. The weekend was nearly over, and I could hardly expect Providence to offer me so promising a chance again. When finally they did appear, and made their way to the hotel boathouse, I was in a state of desperation. We'll take the punt. Very good, sir. Let's have some more cushions and an awning. Yes, sir. Ready, darling? <laughs> they drifted gently off downstream, and for a while I followed them on foot, hoping for I knew not what. I had the poison with me, but they hadn't even taken a picnic basket. It was possible, however, that they might stop somewhere for refreshment. They did stop shortly afterwards, but not for refreshment, and judging by past experience, they'd be there for hours. I decided to hire a boat myself. I shouldn't take her down there if I were you, sir. Oh, why not? Well, they close the weir gates at two o'clock. Ah, is that dangerous? Aye. There have been one or two nasty accidents. People getting carried over the weir. Oh, really? Aye. You'll see a notice further down telling folks to moor up securely. Do you get any warning? Aye. They all up a red flag and sound a hooter. Thanks. <laughs> I'll be careful. The rest followed automatically. I found the punt moored under some overhanging branches further up the reach. I tied my own punt by the bank about 30 yards upstream and, pulling off my clothes, slipped over the side into the water. <sighs> my positioning was perfect and it took me but a second to untie the clumsy granny knot by which Mr. Ascoyne Dascoyne had secured the punt to its pole. It was beautifully timed. I was sorry about the girl, but found some relief in the reflection that she'd presumably, during the weekend, already undergone a fate worse than death. Then I conceived a brilliant idea. I would write a carefully phrased letter of condolence to old Ascoyne Dascoyne. There would be an agreeable feeling of revenge for his cruelty to Mama, and further, it did not fail to occur to me that there was, at the moment, a vacancy in the banking house. Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne duly rose to the bait. Mr. Mazzini, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Please be seated. Thank you. Ah, that photograph, isn't that, um... My late son, yes. Yes, a great loss. He was young and foolish, but I believe had he been spared until his maturity... Yes, it, it was my consciousness of that which led me to presume to tender you my sympathy, sir. I am glad that you did so. A loss so tragic serves to put lesser matters into their proper perspective. If I remember rightly, Mr. Mazzini, some years ago I received a communication from your mother. It was, I believe, in connection with your career. Hello, Louis. You look very pleased with yourself. And so do you, Isabel. I have news. And so do I. What is it? No, yours first. Lionel and I have fixed a date for our wedding. In two months' time. Well, my congratulations. No, I should congratulate him. I compliment you. Now your news. Well, it's nothing so exciting as yours. I went today to see Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne, my cousin, you know. He has a private banking house in the city. He offered me employment at once at five pound a week with excellent prospects of promotion. Louis. I am so glad for you. Well, thank you. Louis, do you remember? What? Once in this room after my party. I kissed you. Yes. And you were horrible to me. Mm, yes. I made fun about you being related to the Dascoins. I'm sorry, Louis. Oh, you take it more seriously now? Yes. Louis... Kiss me to show you've forgiven me. No. 
It would be wrong. You're pledged to Lionel. And I behave like a cad that night. I like you when you behave like a cad. The next candidate for removal seemed to be young Henry Dascoigne, 24 years old, recently married, as yet without issue. I had quite an accumulation by now of Dascoigne data culled from newspapers and periodicals, and I looked through it for a possible approach to Henry. I soon found one. This interesting view of the picturesque village of Wimborne was taken by Mr. Henry Dascoigne, an enthusiastic photographer, who has contributed many a beautiful study to our pages. I bought the necessary equipment, second-hand, and bicycled down the following weekend. It seemed to me that I could find no better subject for my first essay in photography than the village inn and it was through the viewfinder of my second-hand Thornton Picard that I first saw Henry Dascoigne emerging from the saloon bar. He watched me for a few moments, then came over. Excuse me? Yes? Isn't that a Thornton Picard? Yes, it is. Are you a photographer? <laughs> Dabbling it, you know. Got a Sanger Shepherd myself. Well, a Sanger Shepherd. Nice little camera, focal plane shutter, rapid rectilinear and all that. Really? Look here, why not come up to my house and I'll show it to you. I'd like you to meet my wife, too. Well, delighted. My name's Dascoigne, by the way. And mine's Bazzini. You don't do your developing and so on in the house, then? No, I've had the potting shed fixed up as a darkroom. Oh, I say. <laughs> Couldn't have suited better if it had been built for it. Oh. Had the equipment sent down from town. There's everything to hand. Developer dishes here, mm -hmm. toning bath here, whole plate enlarger. This is perfect. <laughs> Not too bad, is it? I'll show you some quarter plates I've taken in the village, if you like. Oh, yes, please. Oh, uh, talking of the village, by the by, I don't know if you're thinking of sending any of your efforts here to some periodical, but there's just one thing. Uh, yes? <laughs> I'm sure you're a good fellow. I wouldn't like to ask you. Ask me what? Oh, I'd be most grateful if you'd keep back that last plate you exposed. The inn? But it was delightful. Yes, yes. Uh, um, no, the fact is my wife has views about such places, so I never go in them, you understand? Ah, uh, well, well, naturally, I wouldn't dream of embarrassing you. <laughs> I knew you were a good fellow. The mental picture of his wife that I formed from Henry's words left me unprepared for the charm of the woman I was to meet. She was as tall and slender as a lily and as beautiful. You'll take some sherry? Oh, uh, well, thank you. I, um... My husband and I never touch alcohol, but we see no reason on that account to enforce our views on our guests. I could well understand Henry's visits to the village inn. Mrs. Dascoigne was beautiful, but what a prig she was. I wondered how to ingratiate myself with her and decided to attack on her own ground with her own weapons. I'm afraid we can offer you only a simple luncheon, Mr. Mazzini, but if you would care to stay, we should be pleased to welcome you at our table. You are most kind, but I feel I should not intrude. It is no intrusion. Well, I'm afraid it is. May I explain? Please do. It was only when your husband told me his name that I realised that I'd come by chance into the most embarrassing situation. My mother, you see, was a member of the Dascoin family. She married, as they thought, beneath her, and from that day, they refused to recognize her or my existence. I feel, therefore, that although in the circumstances you might hesitate to say so to my face, you and your husband would prefer not to receive me at your table. Perhaps you'd be good enough to explain matters to your husband for me, and I shall naturally leave the neighborhood at once. Mr. Mazzini, please sit down. Oh, well. You have exhibited the most delicate feelings... I know nothing of the history to which you refer, but I have often felt that the attitude of my husband's family has failed to move with the times, that they think too much of the rights of nobility and too little of its duties. How true. The very honesty of your behaviour would appear to me to prove them wrong. Was Lord Tennyson far from the mark when he wrote, Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood? I hope you will stay to luncheon.
My impersonation of a man of striking character was such a resounding success that Mrs. Dascoyne invited me to spend the following Saturday to Monday with them. When I returned to the somewhat contrasting atmosphere of Clapham, I found the Hallwoods' house in a whirl with preparation for Sibella's wedding to Lionel, which was to take place the next day. Before going to bed that evening, I wandered into the old nursery to fetch a book I'd left there. Well, Sibella, you're not looking as radiantly happy as young females in your situation are supposed to look. I was just thinking of all the fun we've had in this room, you and I. And Lionel. Yes, and Lionel. Oh, oh, Louis, I don't want to marry Lionel. Why not? He's so dull. <laughs> well, I must admit he exhibits the most extraordinary capacity for middle age that I've ever encountered in a young man of twenty-four. However, it's a bit late in the day to think of that, isn't it? I know. That only makes it worse. I always told you you should marry me. I know. That makes it worse too. I couldn't help feeling that even Sibella's capacity for lying was going to be taxed to the utmost. Time had brought me revenge on Lionel, and as the Italian proverb says, revenge is a dish which people of taste prefer to eat cold. The following Saturday, I left London in the middle of the night and reached Henry's house just before dawn. It took a mere five minutes to get into the potting shed and substitute petrol for paraffin in the dark room lamp. Then I repaired to a meadow and took a few hours' sleep while awaiting the hour at which I could reasonably arrive at the house. But the day dragged by in an agony of suspense for me. Henry took photograph after photograph, but seemed to have no urge whatever to follow it up with a visit to the dark room. I began to fear he'd suddenly taken the pledge. Hold it. That's perfect. There. <laughs> I think that'll do it. <laughs> Look, Edith, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just go and develop these before tea. Care to come, Mr. Mazzini? Uh, well, I, I, I would indeed, but I have a slight headache, you know, the sun, I think, and I'm afraid the chemicals wouldn't improve it. Pity. Mr. Mazzini and I will have tea under the tulip tree. Right, yeah. I've always found that most beneficial for a headache. With milk, Mr. Mazzini? Please. Thank you. Mr. Mazzini. Yes. I hope you will forgive me speaking to you on a more personal matter. But it worries me that Henry should spend so much time on his hobby that he's little left for any more useful activity. Has he never shown any wish for a career in politics? None. Nor any other ambitions? One only. To win a prize at the Salon of Photography in Brussels. Can you smell something burning, Mr. Mazzini? Well, I expect they're burning some leaves at the bottom of the garden. But they can't be at this time of year. Oh, look! The potting shed's on fire! Henry! No, no, you stay here. I'll go. Henry! 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 Needless to say, I was too late. The funeral service was held in the village church at Chalfont prior to internment in the family vault. Mrs. Dascoyne, who had discerned in me a man of delicate sensibility and high purpose, asked me to accompany her on the cross-country journey. The occasion was interesting in that it provided me with my first sight of the Dascoynes en masse. Interesting, but somewhat depressing, for it emphasized how far I had yet to travel. There was the Duke, Ethelred, whose wife and twin sons had fortunately died of diphtheria. There was my employer, Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne. The service element consisted of Admiral Lord Horatio Dascoyne and General Lord Rufus Dascoyne. Next to him was Lady Agatha Dascoyne. Rufus, wake up! Oh, yeah, run. Run, run, run. And in the pulpit, talking interminable nonsense, the Reverend Lord Henry Dascoyne. no exaggeration to say that the life cut short was one rich in achievement and promise of service to humanity. Amen. 
The Dascoins certainly appeared to have accorded with the tradition of the landed gentry and sent the fool of the family into the church. Here's your carriage. Well, goodbye, Edith, my dear. Goodbye, Uncle Etheret. No fretting now. After all, one thing to be said, we all have to come to it. A yeah, great thing, you know, family vault like ours. Constant reminder of one's heritage. Now, take this newfangled cremation nonsense. Who wants to see his nearest and dearest put in an incinerator? Yeah, I think, sir, Mrs. Dascoin should leave. The wind is turning cold. Ah, as Mrs. Dascoin thinks best. I'm glad we had Cousin Henry to take the service. Boring old ass, but he keeps the thing in the family, what, what? Ah, people getting strange ideas these days. Had a fellow write to me not so long ago, wanted to bury his mother here, from Tooting or somewhere. Start letting strangers in, the place will be full up. No room for us, eh? <laughs> I privately promised him that I would make it my business to see there was room for him. Uncle Etheret is not the most tactful of men. Well, I could gladly have struck him. Thank you for intervening when you did. Oh, no, not at all. The house will be so empty when I get back. And yet he will be in it everywhere. I find the thought of life there hard to face. Well, must you stay there? A new environment? A... I must. For one reason, if no other. I'd say I was running away. But there was truth in all these rumours. Rumours? In the village, there's been gossip. They say Henry drank in secret. No. They even say that that was the cause of the accident. Well, I'm sure that Henry would never have professed one thing and practised another. I too, I'm sure. Otherwise, I think I could not survive. We have a long way to go. Try to sleep a little. Sleep does not come easily. Please try. I was conscious that a new obsession was about to join the one that I should wear the coronet of the Duke of Chalfont. It was that Edith Dascoigne should wear that of the Duchess beside me, and I resolved to embark upon her courtship as soon as a decent period of mourning should have elapsed. A day or so later, my plans were materially advanced as the result of an unforeseen but highly agreeable conversation with my employer, Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne. Let's see, Nee. Yes, sir. Now, I've watched your progress here with great care. In view of that, and in order that you may be able to adopt a style of living befitting a member of the Dascoyne family, I've decided to appoint you my private secretary at a salary of £500 per annum. Lord Ascoyne? Thank you, sir. I left the Hallwoods house and took a bachelor apartment in St. James's. Clapham no longer held Sibella's presence to compensate me for the tedious journey between the suburbs and the city. Anyhow, it would be vastly more convenient for her to visit me in my new surroundings. Louis, it's very wrong of me to visit you here. Why? A married woman calling on a bachelor, a dangerous bachelor, in his apartments. I? Dangerous? These things only become wrong when people know about them. This is a very discreet apartment. That's why I chose it. So that young women could call on you in safety? So that one young woman could. How did you know she'd want to? I hoped. And how did you enjoy your honeymoon? Not at all. Not at all? Not at all. And how was Italy? Oh, impossible. Every time I wanted to go shopping, Lionel dragged me off to a church or picture gallery. He said he wanted to improve his mind. He has room to do so. <laughs> I should reprove you for saying unkind things about him. But I can't. Oh, Louis, I think I've married the most boring man in London. In England? In Europe. Oh, the Italian men are so handsome. But I can never get away from Lionel for a moment. Oh, but I was forgetting. You're Italian. Half? Louis, I can speak frankly to you, can't I? Well, if not to me, to whom? I shall go mad. Already, when he touches me, I want to scream. When you touch me, Louis, I want power. Oh, what am I doing? You know very well. You're playing with fire. At least it warms me. I must go. Lionel is dining at home tonight. And where is Lionel dining tomorrow night? With some business acquaintances. Ah, and where are you dining tomorrow night? Here. Here. Poor little imprisoned bird. While she was welcome to come and flutter her wings with me, 
I could think of many more disagreeable ways of killing time pending the arrival of the moment when the conventional decencies would permit me to make my declaration to Edith. As to the other undertaking, I had not forgotten or forgiven the boredom of the sermon at young Henry's funeral, and I decided to promote the Reverend Lord Henry Dascoigne to next place on the list. I therefore assumed the garb and character of a colonial bishop spending his vacation making a collection of brass rubbings from country churches. <laughs> Good evening, my lord. Good evening, my lord. Yes. Oh, <laughs> good evening. As I was um, just taking a, a rubbing of, uh, of this most interesting brass. An ancestress of my dear late wife. Mm -hmm. uh, allow me to introduce myself. Henry Dascoigne, rector of this parish. Ah, uh, Septimus Wilkinson, bishop of Matabeleland. I'm spending my vacation taking a cycling tour around your beautiful country churches. Ah, have you noticed our clerestre? E cl 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 uh, yes, yes, exquisite. Mm. The corbels are very fine. Mm. Perhaps your lordship would permit me to show you one or two other things in which we take a pride. Oh, I should be most interested. Well, our most notable features, of course, are the Dascoigne memorials. Indeed. Every member of the family, to a cadet branch of which I have the honour to belong, is buried here in the family vault. Oh, I see. The church is exceptionally endowed also with items of architectural interest. Mm -hmm. You will note that our chantry displays the crocketed and finial doji, which marks it as very early perpendicular. Mm. The, the, the bosses to the pendant are typical, and I always say that my west window has all the exuberance of Chaucer without happily any of the concomitant crudities of his period. Oh, yes, yes, quite. <laughs> now we approach the front. Ah, oh, the front. Mm -hmm. At last he did as I had hoped and invited me to dinner. The Reverend Lord Henry was not, I am glad to say, one of those newfangled parsons who carry the principles of their vocation uncomfortably into private life. Uh, my lord, the port is with you. Ah, ah, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how do you find the wine? Mm. Mm. Admirable. Coburn 69. Mm. No finer year, in my view. My doctor, though, is of a different opinion. And what does he favour? Total abstinence, I regret to say. <laughs> dear me, dear me. Would you care for a cigar? Thank you. Excuse me while I get you one. No, my doctor is continually warning me about the state of my arteries. But I say to him, what possible harm can there be in one glass of an evening, <coughs> or even two. Do you have, well, what harm indeed? You do not condemn me then? Oh, not in the least. There, uh, my lord. I think you'll find this cigar as admirable in its way as the Coburn 69. <laughs> Thank you. If I may say so, without disrespect to my superiors, your visit has brought me something which I could not expect from any churchman in this country. It had indeed, for the arsenic which I had purloined for young Henry and had not used was now dissolving in old Henry's fourth glass of Coburn 69. <coughs> 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 On my return to London, I decided to proceed methodically with the elimination of the remaining minor obstacles. Lady Agatha Dascoigne was a pioneer in the campaign for women's suffrage. Votes for women! Votes for women! Down with male tyranny! 
with the inconvenient consequence that Lady Agatha's public appearances were invariably made under the watchful eyes of the Metropolitan Police. And when she was not making public appearances, she was in prison, and still more inaccessible. Secret plans have been made for Lady Agatha to celebrate her latest release from Holloway by ascending in a balloon and dropping a shower of leaflets over Whitehall and the West End. On hearing of this, I had a brainwave. Not for nothing had I been an ardent toxophilite in my late teens. Good morning, sir. I want a bow and arrow. Pass the leaflets up one bundle at a time. That's right. Steady on the ropes now. No, dear, that's the ballast. Steady, Miss Harbuckle. Pull off the ropes now. Keep the basket level. Perfectly composed, I waited by the window of my apartment. My meteorological calculations proved correct. Borne steadily along on the prevailing wind, Lady Agatha hove in sight. I took careful aim and fired. I shot an arrow in the air. She fell to earth in Barclay Square. Admiral Lord Horatio Dascoigne presented a more difficult problem. He scarcely ever set foot ashore, and I was beginning to feel that this task was beyond even my ingenuity when he was conveniently involved in a naval disaster, which arose from a combination of natural obstinacy and a certain confusion of mind, unfortunate in one of his rank. Full speed ahead. In this park, sir. Full speed ahead, Captain. But Admiral Dascoigne... Am I in command of this ship, or are you, sir? I am, sir. Full speed ahead. Destroy on the port bow, sir. Bring her to port, Captain. Surely you mean stop it, sir? Port. Both ships sank almost immediately, though fortunately all hands were saved, save one. Admiral Lord Horatio, obstinate to the last, insisted on going down with his ship. General Lord Rufus Dascoigne, on the other hand, who never tired of demonstrating how he'd fought the most calamitous campaign of the South African War, was a fairly easy proposition. It seemed appropriate that he who had lived amidst the cannon's roar should die explosively. I therefore concealed in a pot of caviar a simple but powerful homemade bomb, and through the post I sent caviar to the general. Um, caviar. I wonder who said that. Good stuff. They used to get a lot of it in the crime in. One thing the Ruskies do really well. well. What was I saying? When you were a subaltern. Ah, gad, yes. We weren't wet nurse then, I can tell you. Stood me in good stead in the last war. You remember at Spy and Cop? Enemy concealed behind a small copse here. Twenty-four foot dug in here. Suddenly they charged downhill. I held our guns fire until I could see the whites of their eyes. Assume this pot of caviar is the battery. Then I gave the order, fire! One could almost believe there was a curse on our unfortunate family, Mazzini. Indeed, Lord Asquin, one could. I don't know if you realise how close this series of tragedies has brought you to the succession. Do you mean... Do you not realise that you are heir presumptive to the dukedom? That is to say, in the event of the present duke, Ethelred, dying without issue, I alone intervene between you and the title. But, sir, you... Um... And I am an old man. I have never really recovered from the first of these calamities. Do you mean that I might become Duke of Chalfont? I mean that you almost certainly will. And in view of that, I 
feel it would be more fitting that you should cease to be an employee here and become instead my partner. One of my first tasks as partner was to interview Lionel, who came cap, or rather silk hat, in hand. The fact is, old boy, we sold short, and the market hasn't dropped as we expected. Yes, I feel entitled to point out that we here in this bank regard our function as the encouragement of constructive investment and not the financing of mere gambling transactions. I know, old boy, but it's like this. At the same time, however, we generally prepare to give a client a second chance. We will renew at three and a half percent. Three and a half percent? Isn't that a bit steep? It would have delighted me to refuse him. However, a bankrupt Lionel could hardly have continued to support Sibella in her extravagances, and I had no wish to do so myself, especially as I judged that the time was now ripe to make a move in the matter of Edith. Dascoin. Mrs. Dascoin, I'm now going to say something presumptuous, and you must order me from your house if you wish. It is this. If you should ever feel that the constant support of a devoted admirer would be of assistance to you, I should be most honoured if you would permit me to offer you my hand in marriage. Uh, Mr. Pezzini... This is a shock. I am most touched, most grateful. But I, I, I could not consider even the possibility of remarrying. Uh, yes, 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 of course you're right. I've, I've spoken too boldly, and do forgive me far too soon. Please, only regard what I have said merely as something to draw upon should you ever feel so inclined. Sibella was waiting for me when I got back. I was pleased to see her, for while I never admired Edith as much as when I was with Sibella, I never longed for Sibella as much as when I was with Edith. I'm afraid I'm late. Have you been bored? No. I've been looking into the fire and thinking. What about? Oh, how we used to roast chestnuts around the other fire, and what a lot has happened since. Such as? How you told me not to marry Lionel because you might be Duke one day, and how I laughed at you. <laughs> And how I married Lionel, and now you very nearly are a duke. We are much better off as we are, you and I. It's all very well for you to say that. You're not married to Lionel. Let me get you a glass of wine. Thank you, Louis. The advantage of our association is that we see each other when we want to, and we're not obliged to see each other when we don't want to. We don't see each other as often as I'd like to. You've been away the whole weekend. Yes, I had to go. Why? Well, I think you'll find this Madeira very much to your taste. You haven't answered my question. Oh, uh, oh to see Mrs. Dascoin, the widow of that cousin of mine who was killed. All your cousins seem to get killed. I really wouldn't be in the least surprised if you'd murdered them all yourself. Oh, oh. <laughs> Goodness me, how clumsy of me, eh? I'm sorry. Louis. Hmm. Whatever made you say that? Just... Silliness. Well, if you promise not to tell anyone, I'll let you into my guilty secret. I did murder them all. Hmm. I've suspected it for a long time. What's she like? Who? Mrs. Dascoin. Oh, she's, um, tall, slender. Beautiful? Yes, I suppose some people would call her beautiful. Would you? Mm. I suppose so. Never really thought about it. What would you say if she asked you about me? I'd say you were the perfect combination of imperfections. I'd say that your nose was just a little too short, your mouth just a little too wide, but yours was a face that a man could see in his dreams for the whole of his life. I'd say that you were vain, selfish, cruel, deceitful. I'd say that you were adorable. I'd say you were Sibella. What a pretty speech. I mean it. Come and say it to me again. Shortly afterwards, my employer had a stroke. There was little that could be done, and the doctor gave him a month at the most to live. I was glad, after all his kindness to me, that I should not have to kill the old man. Soon, the only obstacle between me and my inheritance would be Duke 
Ethelred himself. I could lay no plan for disposing of him, as the life he led within the great stone walls of Chalfont Castle was a closed book to me. I was gloomily examining the problem for the hundredth time as I awaited one day the expected arrival of Sibella at my apartments. Coming! Good afternoon, Mr. Metzini. Mrs. Daskoyne. I was passing through St. James, and uh, I thought I would take the opportunity to call on you. Well, was that wise? Uh, I, I, um, I mean, uh, discreet. There are some conventions which must be governed by individual circumstances. Surely it is safe for a woman to visit a man of your reputation. No, no it is of your reputation that I'm thinking. Without being uh, inhospitable, I, I'd be happier if your visit were not a long one. Uh, but please, uh, do come in. Thank you. I appreciate the scrupulousness of your motives. I have, anyhow, only one important matter to speak of. And that is? I have thought a great deal about what you said to me at our last meeting, and I've reconsidered the offer you made to me. Thank you again for it, and accept it gladly. Oh. You, um, robbed me of words. I think, however, we should make no announcement for three months at least. Well, as you think best. Do you not think, though, that perhaps Uncle Ethelred, as head of the family, should be told at once? Perhaps so. Yes, yes, I'll write to him. Goodbye, Louis. Goodbye, Edith. You leave behind you the happiest man in London. This was not a piece of news which I was looking forward to breaking to Sibella. She had no rights in the matter, but women have a disconcerting ability to make scenes out of nothing and to prove themselves injured when they themselves are at fault. A day or so later, I received a letter from Lionel. He requested an interview with me at his house on a matter of some delicacy. I was somewhat perturbed, for nine times out of ten, what is referred to as a matter of some delicacy is, in point of fact, one of extreme indelicacy. Two days later, therefore, I made the tedious journey to Bayswater. It was typical of Lionel that he should live on the wrong side of the park. Always admired the sporting way in which you took Sibella marrying me and not you. <laughs> Some fellows would have taken it very differently. But may the best man win, you said. And when I won, you behaved like a gentleman. <clears throat> you sure you won't have a drink? Huh? No, thank you. Never during the day. I thought, as you'd been keen on Sibella at one time, and you and I are old friends, I'd ask you to help us. Help you? Oh. I told you, some time back, business hasn't been going so well. Oh, since then, it's gone worse. I'm bankrupt. <laughs> so I, I said to myself, why not talk to my old pal, Louis Mazzini, who we used to have such jolly times with round the old nursery fire, roasting chestnuts. Well, I'm afraid your memory is deceiving you. By no stretch of imagination could you and I be described as ever having been pals. Huh? And if I remember correctly... We detested each other cordially from the first day we met with a detestation which increased with our years. Always thought of you as a pal. Always have done. That's why I said to myself... No, it's I, only fair to warn you that any further expense of breath on this subject will be a complete waste of time. You know what you're doing. Condemning me to death. What do you mean? It's the only way out for me. Do away with myself. But if you knew how absurd <laughs> these histrionics sound... I'm insured. At least the little woman will be provided for. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Louis, I appeal to you. On my knees, I appeal to you. Not for my sake, but for the sake of the little woman. Oh, please rise from that absurd position. <laughs> All I can say is I think you're a cad. A selfish cad. Let me remind you of a little not-so-ancient history. When I was a draper's assistant, and you a rich father's son, you showed me no kindness. Now our positions are reversed, and you come whining to me for favours. Uh, draper's assistant. <laughs> that's right. Rotten little counter-jumper, that's all you are. Very high and mighty now, but your mother married an Italian organ grinder. Get up out of that chair. Eh? I said, get up. I will not tolerate hearing my mother's name on your coarse lips. 
So, you want to fight? Well, whatever else Lionel Holland is, is not a coward. There seems no point in prolonging this vulgar brawl, and I refuse to demean myself by fighting with a drunken oaf. Oh, oh. And if you take my advice, you'll pick yourself up and go and put your head under a cold tap. When I got back to my apartment, I took a bath and decided to relax for half an hour and efface this disagreeable scene from my memory. I was not allowed to relax for long. Sibella! Oh, Louis. Really, Sibella, you do choose the most unusual hours to visit a fellow. Well, you better come in. I'm sorry to worry you when you must be so busy, but I have a piece of important news. Bad news. I thought you ought to know at once. Lionel has found out about us, about my coming here. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. I had the most dreadful scene with him last night. Well, I suppose even Lionel isn't stupid enough to be deceived forever. You won't take it so calmly when you hear. He's going to start divorce proceedings. Well, how very unsophisticated of him. There's only one way out that I can see. And that is? Lionel is still in love with me. My happiness is all he cares about. He might do the gentlemanly thing and let me divorce him. If? If I were in a position to explain to him that otherwise he would be jeopardising the social position not only of the future Duke, but also of the future Duchess of Chalfont. I see. Well, you're a clever little thing, Sibella, but not quite clever enough. What do you mean? I mean that not only do I know that you're blackmailing me, an ugly word, but the only appropriate one, but I also know that you're bluffing. Call my bluff and see. I will. It so happens that I was with Lionel less than an hour ago, and it was transparently clear from his demeanour and conversation that he hadn't the faintest suspicion that you and I had any relationship other than that of, as he would probably put it, old pals who used to roast chestnuts together round the jolly old nursery fire. So, while thanking you for the honour that you've done me, I must decline your offer, because I have other arrangements which make it impossible for me to accept. Namely? I'm shortly going to announce my engagement to Mrs. Daskoin. May I say that I think you've behaved despicably. And has it ever occurred to you, Sibella, that we serve each other right, you and I? Would it be asking too much of your manners to escort me to the door? I had suspected that to confide the secret of my engagement to Mrs. Dascoyne to the Duke might be an adroit manoeuvre, and I was proved correct, for it produced an invitation for Edith and me to spend a few days at the castle. I must confess that I could not suppress an agreeable sensation of triumph as I approached the gateway. It was just an informal little house party. Our fellow guests were Lady Redpole and her daughter, Maud, who most suitably resembled nothing so much as a Redpole cow and had little more conversational ability. Did you go to the opera this season? No. In the afternoon, Ethel had invited me to inspect the castle. I had never been in a building so lavishly equipped with the instruments of violent death. Feel the weight of that sword. Our ancestors must have been fine men, Louis. They...
ill-adapted to the discreet requirements of 20th century homicide, and the end of the day found my host still intact and myself still without a plan. Try this. Coburn 69. What? Coburn 69. Family favourite, so to speak. Uh, old Henry was inordinately fond of it. Yes, I believe. They say young Henry drank too, you know. <laughs> oh, surely not. I oh, wouldn't say anything to his wife, of course. <sighs> Beautiful woman, Edith. You're a lucky fellow, Louis. I never cease to be conscious of it. Oh, I suppose I ought to call you Louis. Now you're one of the family. Have a nut. Thank you. What do you think of Maud? Well, uh, a charming girl, though perhaps at times her conversation is a little uh, lacking in sparkle. Most boring woman I've ever met. Only got two interests in life, her stomach and her horses. Plain, too, but good breeding stock. Oh, yes, good breeding stock, the Red Poles, and they litter a very high proportion of boys. Do I gather you to mean... Spoke to old Lady Red Pole this afternoon. Only too glad to get the girl off her hands. Oh, my congratulations. Uh, duty to the family, really. When does the uh, union take place? Very soon. I'm not growing any younger. Mightn't get a son first time, either. Have a quiet wedding, I thought. We shall honeymoon on the Riviera, and then go on to Italy afterwards. No sense in inflicting her on one's friends. Oh, yeah. When she's got a family, that'll keep her out of the way. This news threw me into such distress of mind that had I had poison in my possession, I would probably have administered it to Ethelred there and then and chanced the consequent inquiries. One thing was clear. If I did not succeed in disposing of him during this present visit to the castle, I was likely to see the ruin of my whole campaign. Next morning... I went out shooting with Ethelred, or rather to watch Ethelred shooting, for my principles will not allow me to take a direct part in blood sports. Ah, left and a right, by God. What do you think of that, Louis? Remarkable. Ah. Morning, Your Grace. Been round the traps yet, Hoskins? Oh, not yet, Your Grace. Don't call that way, sir. Oh, why? Got a trap set there, sir. Oh, my God, so you have. Well, I shouldn't like to get caught in that. What's it for? Been losing so much game lately. Had to start setting the man traps again. Place is stiff with poachers. Did you ever catch any this way? Caught one yesterday. And what do you do with them? Charge them? No. Hoskins thrashes them and lets them go. They don't poach on my land again, I can tell you. All right, Hoskins. Keep moving the traps around or the blighters will tell each other where they are. Yes, Your Grace. Ah. Getting on for lunchtime. Shall we go back? Yeah, oh, by all means. Oh, uh, oh lost something? Yes, um, my cigarette case. I must have dropped it back there when we were talking to Hoskins. You go on. I'll catch you up. Can you manage that thing by yourself, Hoskins? Yes, thank you, sir. Where are you putting it? By this elm, sir. I've got a notion these ruffians come up the gully here. Are you uh, looking for something, sir? Uh, no, 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 it's all, it's all right. I thought I'd lost my cigarette case. Find it? Yes, thanks. Might have another walk around this afternoon if you feel like it. That would be most pleasant. So after luncheon, we went out to massacre a few more unfortunate birds. Ah, blasted birds! They seemed to get up rather quickly, didn't they? What do you mean? As though they were disturbed. Listen! Huh? What is it? Over there! Thought I heard something. Someone moving through the bracken. Another approaching ruffian! By the gully! Ah. Bloody if I can see anything! He may be lying doggo. Try a bit further to your left. Oh, right here? By the tree! Pretty sudden it came from there. Ah! Blasted! Oh. What's happened? Oh. Why these blasted traps? Oh. Oh. Hoskins must have moved them round. Oh, yeah. Louis, get me out of this. Oh. Oh, hurry up, man! Be quiet, Ethelred. I want to talk to you for a minute. What's the matter? You gone mad? No, but if you make any more noise, I'll blow your head off. By the time anyone's heard the shot, I shall be running back towards the castle, shouting for help. I'll say that you uh, stepped on the trap, that your gun went off accidentally as it fell, so be quiet. <laughs> to spare you as much pain as possible, I'll be brief. And when I've finished, 
I shall kill you. <laughs> and you'll be the sixth Daskoin that I've killed. You want to know why? In return for what the Daskoins did to my mother. Devil! You yourself refused to grant her dying wish, which was to be buried here at Chalfont. And when I saw her poor little coffin slide underground and saw her exiled in death as she had been in life, I swore to have my revenge on your intolerable pride. That revenge I'm just about to complete. Hey, it's clear that you're insane. Give me that gun at once. No. From here, I think, the wound should look consistent with the story that I shall tell. No! And so Ethelred, 8th Duke of Chalfont, duly came to his place in the family vault. There were few Dascoins left to mourn him. My employer, Lord Dascoin the banker, who was 9th Duke of Chalfont for the shortest possible period, having expired of shock on hearing that he'd succeeded to the title. And so I became the 10th Duke of Chalfont. And one evening, a few weeks later, an affecting little feudal ceremony took place to welcome me into residence at the castle. And I promise you that my first consideration, and that of Mrs. Dascoin, who has done me the honour to consent to be my wife, oh. will be the welfare of the estate and of the people who live on it. God bless you all. Uh, the Sprocket Farm, love your grace. Ah, good evening. Pennyman, your grace, from Sprocket's Farm, and uh, Mrs. Pennyman. Your grace. How do you do? My son, Tom. And do you work at Sprocket's Farm, Tom? Yes, Your Grace. Oh, aye, he's a good lad. <laughs> Mr. Wyvold, Your Grace, chief herdsman at Sprocket's Farm. Oh, yes, I've heard of you, Mr. Wyvold. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Your Grace. Uh, Mr. Burgoyne. Uh, Sprocket's Farm? No, Your Grace. I'm from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? A matter of some delicacy. The blow was so sudden that I found it hard to collect my thoughts. And as I walked away from the Great Hall, I wondered which of them could it be. Young Ascoyne, Henry, Ethelred, the parson, the general, Lady Agatha, or could it be all of them? Now, you are, I take it, His Grace the Duke of Chalfont. I am. I am Detective Inspector Burgoyne of the Criminal Investigation Department, and I hold a warrant for your arrest on the charge of murder. Murder? Of murdering Mr. Lionel Holland at... Murdering? Whom? Mr. Lionel Holland, at number 242, Connaught Square, Bayswater, on the 17th of October last. Utterly bewildered, I tried to fathom what series of events could conceivably have led to this not very amusing irony. I could only suppose that Lionel had actually carried out that drunken threat of suicide. But how then had the blame fallen on me? Time alone and the trial would reveal the answer. Seeing no reason to forego any of the available privileges of my rank, I exercise my right to be tried before the House of Lords. Louis Dascoyne Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont, you as a peer of England are indicted for murder. How say you, Your Grace? Are you guilty of the felony with which you are charged, or not guilty? Not guilty. How will you be tried? By God and my peers. God send your grace a good deliverance. That the evidence I shall give before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Uh, Mrs. Holland, uh, will you tell their lordships in your own words the substance of the conversation you had with your husband the evening before his death? He told me that Louis the prisoner, was coming to see him the next day on a rather delicate matter. Uh, did he indicate what the matter was? He discovered that the prisoner and I had been... Uh, uh, had well, been on terms of intimacy? 
Yes. And what was his attitude? He felt that the correct thing to do was to tell him to his face that he intended to start proceedings for divorce. Now, from your knowledge of the prisoner, uh, how would you expect him to receive that news? I should expect him to be very angry. Now he was heir to a dukedom, he had no more use for me. I see. He was trying to discard you? Yes. Mrs. Holland, I apologize for submitting you to this ordeal, but will you tell their lordships how you found your husband's body? I came back at about half past four. I went into my husband's study. He was lying on the floor with a dagger stuck in his chest. Uh, one last question, Mrs. Holland. Had your husband ever at any time threatened suicide? Never. Thank you, Mrs. Holland. My client craves their lordship's permission to cross-examine the witness himself. Their lordships grant their permission. Uh, thank you. Mrs. Holland, you understand the meaning of being on oath? Of course. And you realize that a life may depend upon the truthfulness of your evidence? Yes. I put it to you that your story of your conversation with your husband on the night before his death is a complete fabrication. It is not. I put it to you that your husband committed suicide. He would never have done that without leaving a message for me. Oh, well, can you swear that he did not? Well, the police searched the room very thoroughly. They didn't find anything. I suggest that your evidence is a tissue of lies dictated by motives of revenge. <laughs> It is not! It is not! I presume that the prisoner has some purpose in these submissions other than that of distressing the witness? My purpose, my lord, is to determine the truth. That, your grace, is the whole purpose of this assembly. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. You are Edith Dascoyne Mazzini, Duchess of Chalfont. I am. When and where did you become the wife of the accused? Yesterday morning in Pentonville Prison. I wanted to publish irrevocably before the whole world my faith in his innocence. I wanted to show by my marriage that, though he was led astray, as I believe, by that innate kindliness,
innocent courtesy of his, which made it so hard for him to rebuff the advances of a woman. I nevertheless regard him as a man to whom I can happily entrust the remainder of my life. I am not alone in these opinions of him. My late husband, Henry, and his late uncle, Ethelred, the Eighth Duke, both unfortunately unable to testify today, these and other members of the Dascoyne family, had they been alive, would, I know, have echoed every word that I have said. Uh, 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 now, uh, Your Grace, the deceased was a client of the banking house of which you are chairman and managing director. He was? In the normal course of business transactions, he would have come to see you at your office. Yes. Instead of which, he asked you to go to his house? Yes. He invited you to his house to discuss business, and you asked their lordships to believe that? Yes. In the course of this uh, business discussion, he burst into tears, fell on his knees, and threatened suicide. Yes. Is that usual in business discussions? Not usual, no. But it happened on this occasion? Yes. And you asked their lordships to believe that? Yes. Then this uh, business discussion became so heated that blows were exchanged and he made a murderous attack on you? Yes. Is that usual in business discussions? No. But it happened on this occasion? Yes. And you asked their lordships to believe that? Yes. Very well. You've heard of cases of a jealous husband and his wife's lover coming to blows? Yes. Frequently? It is one of the clichés of the cheaper kind of fiction. <laughs> I put it to you that in this case it happened not in fiction but in fact. I put it to you that it did not. I put it to you further that being unaware at that time of your future wife's forgiving nature, you assumed that if you were cited in a divorce suit, it would ruin your chances of making this advantageous match with a wealthy and beautiful woman. No, not at all. Still, you were proposing to discard Mrs. Holland? No. Even though you were about to be married to the other lady? Thank you, Your Grace. That is all. I must confess to feeling quite intrigued as to the decision of my peers. My lords, having justly considered your verdict, the question for your lordships is this. Is the prisoner guilty of the felony whereof he stands indicted, or not guilty. Guilty, upon mine honour. Guilty, upon mine honour. Guilty, upon mine honour. Guilty, upon mine honour. Thus was I, Louis Mazzini d'Ascoigne, 10th Duke of Chalfont, unjustly condemned for a murder I did not commit. You have a visitor, Your Grace. My wife? Uh, no, Your Grace, uh, a Mrs. Holland. Sibella, I considered it both seemly and touching that my dear wife should visit me as she did this morning to make her farewells. Your arrival, on the other hand, appears to me unseemly and tasteless in the extreme. I couldn't bear my last sight of you to be that look of hatred you gave me as you went out from the trial. Well, in view of the fact that your evidence had put the rope around my neck, you could hardly expect a glance of warm affection. Isn't there any hope? What hope could there be? I was only thinking that that question you asked at the trial about Lionel leaving a suicide note, suppose he did. Suppose that one were found, even now, this last evening. <clears throat> it would savour of a miracle. Miracles can happen. Miracles could happen. A note might be found. I see. It's strange, isn't it, how things turn out? Now, if you had married me instead of Edith... Or you had married me instead of Lionel... He would still be alive, and you wouldn't be going to be hanged tomorrow morning. Unless, of course, you'd murdered somebody else. All of which is rather beside the point, isn't it? Is it? 
Do you remember in the old days how we used to play ten green bottles? And if one green bottle should accidentally fall, there'll be nine green bottles standing on the wall. Quite a lot of green bottles have accidentally fallen, haven't they? One way or another, and every one of them a dascoin. Yes, we do seem to be a very short-lived family. I must admit. Of course, Edith is only a dascoin by marriage. So I suppose her prospects for a long life are better. Perhaps. Except for a miracle, like the other one we were talking about. Oh, so now we have two miracles in mind, do we? Lionel's note, and Edith's early demise. Yes. Wonder if they're in any way dependent on each other. They might be. What do you think? Time's up, Your Grace. What do you think? <clears throat> Poor Edith. I'm afraid all this is going to take years off her life. Do you think so? Well, I'm almost certain of it. <sighs> Au revoir, Louis. Au revoir, Sibella. So there it was. She would find the note if I, in return, would murder Edith. <laughs> what could I do but accept? After all, I could always decide afterwards which of these two green bottles would accidentally have to fall. Dear Edith, captivating Sibella, how different they were, and how well I knew each of them, or so I thought. But the night has gone by, and nothing has happened. Signed under my hand, this eighth day of August, nineteen hundred and two. Louis Dascoin Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont. <sighs> ah, already. I'm afraid so. If you have any last instructions, well, I think, Colonel, it only remains to thank you for your many kindnesses, Your Grace. <laughs> well, won't you introduce our friend, Mr. Elliot, His Grace, the Duke of Chalfant? Oh, good morning, Your Grace. This won't take a moment, but first, if Your Grace will pardon the liberty, I should like to read some verses composed by myself for use on these melancholy occasions. Your Grace permits. Oh, with pleasure. As you see by this pile of manuscript here, I too have not been idle. Oh, a fellow artist, Your Grace. <clears throat> My friend, reflect. Oh, oh, pardon me. <clears throat> Your grace, reflect while yet of mortal breath some span, however short, is left to thee. How brief the total span twixt birth and death! How long thy coming tenure of eternity! Well, thank you. Uh, Your grace, prepare. Colonel, Colonel. But what does this mean? This letter has come from Whitehall, sir. The messenger said it was to be delivered to you immediately. Excuse me. Thank God. Your Grace, this letter is from the Home Office. Apparently a note has been found, undoubtedly in Mr. Holland's handwriting, expressing his intention to commit suicide. It is a miracle. Yes. It is, uh, like a miracle. Pending receipt of further instructions, I'll try to make you reasonably comfortable in my quarters. <clears throat> I imagine you won't be sorry to leave here. Well, it is a trifle austere. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Elliot. I'm sorry our acquaintance was so uh, short-lived. Good, good morning, Your Grace. Good morning. Well, I'm gratified to think that the Home Office lost no time in ordering your immediate release. Poor Elliot. If he'd not insisted on reading that abominable poem, he'd have had me neatly dangling at the end of his rope before the news arrived. Undoubtedly, yes. He was so looking forward to it. I understand, Your Grace, from the men on duty outside, that a large crowd awaits your leaving. Well, having robbed them of the pleasure of my death, the least I can do is to let them see me alive. 
including, by the way, not only Her Grace the Duchess, but also Mrs. Holland. Oh, I see. How does the song go? How happy could I be with either were t'other dear charmer away? <laughs> Goodbye, Colonel. Uh, Goodbye, Your Grace. All right, Water. Open the gate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excuse me, Your Grace. Yes? I represent the magazine Titbits, by whom I am commissioned to approach you for the publication rights of your memoirs. My memoirs? Oh, my memoirs. My memoirs. A brief history of the events leading thereto, written on the eve of his execution by Louis d'Ascoigne Massini, 10th Duke of Chelfont, <laughs> who ventures to hope that this confession of his guilt may prove not uninteresting to those who remain to read it. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> well. <clears throat> yes, Your Grace? Your memoirs? My God. My memoirs.